Um, hello, everyone. Um, we're at uh, TCT 2019 in San Francisco. Um, I have the honor and pleasure of having with me Dr. Suzanne Barron. Suzanne, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Barron is um, an interventional cardiologist. Uh, she's also the director of interventional cardiology research um, at Leahy Clinic. And, um, you know, she presented two late breaking clinical trials uh, or late breaking clinical science at the uh, TCT 2019 this year. And we're going to talk about it. Um, so, congratulations. Thank uh, you. Exciting stuff. Um, the first uh, paper that we're going to talk about is uh, health status, um, which is uh, an analysis from the Partner 3 data. Yeah. And uh, it looked at patients with severe uh, aortic valve stenosis. And I think the comparison was uh, transcatheter versus surgical yep. aortic valve replacement. So why don't you talk more about the study? Sure. So we know when the uh, clinical results of the Partner 3 data came out that it showed that TAVR uh, was associated with uh, lower rates of mortality, rehospitalization uh, when compared to surgery in patients with aortic stenosis and in, who are at low surgical risk. Um, sure. So one of the things though, that's interesting to look at is to say, well, great, we know that clinically those hard outcomes patients do better, but what about how they feel? Um, and we've done these analyses in the higher risk uh, patient populations, and what we've seen is a little bit what you'd expect. Mm -hmm. Early on at one month when patients you know, are still recovering from their surgery, transcatheter aortic valve replacement is associated with better health status in the higher uh, risk populations. But usually by six to 12 months, once everybody's recovered from their surgery, there's really no significant uh, difference in health status. Patients feel better, doesn't matter how you replace their valve. Mm -hmm. So we were looking uh, in this analysis to say, hey, in a low risk patient population, might we be able to unmask a, lo um, a late health status benefit? So what did you find? I mean, this is an interesting question. And you know, also I think for the audience, uh, may be helpful to define what you exactly mean by health status. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so well, what we did is we measured uh, health status or quality of life in a couple of different ways. Sure. We used uh, different measurement techniques. We used a disease specific uh, scale called the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire, mm -hmm. um, which has been developed in patients who have heart failure, but it's been validated in folks with aortic stenosis as well. Mm -hmm. um, and what we've seen with that is that in an overall summary scale of the KCCQ, changes of up to 5, 10, or 20 points are consistent with small, moderate, and large clinical improvements. So these are things that really mean a lot to a patient mm -hmm. um, to feel better. We also looked at generic health status measurement scales as well, um, things like the SF36 as well as the EQ5D. Those again are generic, they're not aimed for folks who have uh, heart failure, um, like patients with aortic stenosis, sure. but just generalized health, uh, health status. Mm -hmm. And so what we found, um, similar to the prior trials, we did find that at one month, patients with TAVR felt a lot better than patients who had surgical AVR. Mm -hmm. But in contrast to the prior trials, we saw that there was a persistent benefit of TAVR at six months and at a year over surgery um, when we looked at the disease-specific health scales. So that's huge, right? I mean, yeah. it's, 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 it's a paradigm shift, yeah. if you will, because, uh, I mean, Traditionally, and, I, and we know now that the FDA has, has approved, uh, you know, TAVR as a technique for um, aortic valve replacement in patients who are at low risk uh, following surgery for mortality. Right. Um, but like even five years from now, this was not the case. And, you know, your data um, sort of is supplementary to the data that came out, uh, you know, earlier this year. Absolutely. Um, so it's it's really practice changing in, in, in several realms. I think so. You know, I think one of the, you know, one of the cool things that we saw was is that, you know, patients who, patients who were treated with, whether it was transcatheter or surgical aortic valve, by a year, everybody felt significantly better. There was an average of a 19 point change on the KCCQ overall summary scale. So it, you, you got a great benefit from getting your valve replaced. Um, but there was a slightly increase in a benefit for patients who were treated with TAVR, and we really wanted to try to tease out who those patients were mm -hmm. um, for exactly the reason that you said, is how do we sure. use this to try to treat that patient that's sitting in front of us in clinic? Mm -hmm. um, and in our subgroup analyses, we saw that patients who had New York Heart Association class three or four at baseline, um, there was an interaction effect, that those were the patients who did substantially better with TAVR as opposed to surgery. Wow. And so it does make you wonder, um, are those the patients that are driving this, you know, small mm -hmm. but persistent benefit at a year? Yeah. And, and is that something that we can take into account when we're evaluating patients and counseling them as to what the right treatment strategy is for them? Yes. So, you know, we run into this. We started to run into this since the FDA approved uh, TAVR for low risk. Sure. You know, the conversation, uh, we want it to be balanced, right? And we want to be armed with as much information as we can mm -hmm. provide to the patients because it's a decision that they have to make and we have to make. It's a collective decision-making process. 
um, how do how do you how do you talk to patients? How do you present the data? What do you tell them about valve durability in particular? Uh, I know outcomes have been superior, you know, right. with with the transcatheter therapies and now even health status. Right. So, which is another uh, you know our, uh, another uh, you know a piece of information that arms us when we're talking to them. How, how are you? What's the conversation like? You know, just for me and as well as for the listenership. What, sure. what do you think the conversation is like with them? Well, I, I think you mentioned it. I think valve durability. That's that's the big question is yes. how are things going to look in 10 years? And we actually are going to con uh, collect health status out to 10 years Great. to see if this this uh, durability of benefit is there or not. As far as from a health status standpoint, obviously, we'll be looking clinically as well. Yeah. But I think, you know, as far as what I say to patients, you know, we've got two great treatments. I think that it really does come down to that individual. You know, what is their anatomy? What is their coronary artery disease state? What are the things that are important to them as a patient? You know, a lot of patients in the low risk um, population are still working. And so they're, they're saying, hey, I can't take six weeks or three months off you mm -hmm. know, from work to, to recover. I need to know that I'm gonna feel better in a couple of weeks so I can get back to work and yeah. support my family. And so taking their preferences as to what's important into account, yeah. I think this, this data is very complimentary with that. Yeah. Well, great, uh, great stuff. Congratulations. Thank you. And um, you know, look forward to reading the manuscript. Awesome, thank you so much.